Many of the atheists, they believe in science. All these arguments may not satisfy them completely. Many of the atheists, they say that science is a yardstick. They believe science is ultimate. So let's try and prove to this group of atheists also about the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if I know that this atheist believes only in science, after congratulating him, I'll ask him a simple question. That if suppose there is equipment, there is a gadget, who no one in the world has ever seen, and if that gadget is bought in front of you, and if the question is asked, that who will be the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of this gadget? That atheist, he may say, after thinking for a while, the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of a gadget who no one in the world has ever seen, no one in the world knows about it, he will tell you that the creator of that gadget. Or he may say the maker of the gadget. He may say the inventor, he may say the producer, he may say the manufacturer. Whatever he says, it will be somewhat similar. Either creator, manufacturer, producer, maker, inventor, somewhat similar. Just keep that answer at the back of your mind. The second person is the creator, if he says to somebody else, he'll come to know, or a person who does research, but that is secondary. You ask this atheist that how did our universe come into existence? So he will tell you that our universe was initially one primary nebula. Then there was a secondary separation, a big bang, which gave rise to galaxies, stars, moon, sun, and the earth on which we live. This he calls as the big bang. You ask him, when did you come to know about this creation of the universe, about the big bang? He will tell you about 50 years back, 40 years back. So you tell him, this thing what you're mentioning about the Big Bang is already mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30, where Allah says, Avalam yaral lazina kafuru. Do not the unbelievers see, anna samawati wal arda, kaan atrat kan fatakna huma, that the heaven and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder. What you're talking about the Big Bang is already mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran? So he will tell, maybe it's a fluke. Somebody wrote it? No problem. Don't argue with him. Ask him the next question. What is the shape of the earth? So he will tell you, previously the human beings thought that the world was flat. It was in 1577 when Sir Francis Drake, he sailed around the earth that he proved that the earth was spherical. You tell him that the Quran mentions in Surah Naziat, chapter number 79, verse number 30, that Wal ard ba da da We have made the earth x shape. The Arabic word dahaha, one of its meaning is an expanse, and the earth is an expanse. The other meaning is derived from the Arabic word duya, which means an egg. And we know today that the earth is not completely round like a ball. It is starting from the pole and bulging from the center. It is geospherical in shape. It is somewhat similar to the egg. And the Arabic word duya does not refer to a normal egg. It specifically refers to the egg of an ostrich. And if you analyze the shape of the egg of an ostrich, it is geospherical in shape. Imagine, the Quran mentioned that the earth is geospherical 1400 years ago. Who could have mentioned that? So he will tell you, ah, your prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was an intelligent man. Don't argue. Continue. The light of the moon, is it its own line of reflected light? So the atheist will tell you, previously we thought that the light of the moon was its own light. But today we know that the light of the moon is not its own light, it's a reflected light. When did you come to know? He will tell you, we came to know yesterday, 50 years back, 100 years back, 200 years back. Quran mentions 1400 years ago in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 61. That blessed is he who hath placed the constellation in the sky, and therein sun, shams, having its own light, and moon having borrowed light. The Arabic word for sun is shams. Its light is always described as siraj of ahaj meaning a torch or a blazing lamp. And the moon in Arabic is called as Kamar. Its light is always described as Munir or Noor. Munir means borrowed light, and Noor means a reflection of light. And nowhere 
is the moonlight described as Vahaj or Siraj. It's always described as Noor or Munir. Borrowed light or reflection of light. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran 14 years ago? Now there'll be a pause. Don't wait for the reply. Continue. When I was in school, I had learned that the sun revolved, but it was stationary. It did not rotate about its axis. The Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 33, wa nahara. It is Allah who has created the night and the day. Wa shamsa wal kamar, the sun and the moon. Kul fi falaki yasbahoon. Each one traveling in an orbit with its own motion. The Arabic word yasbahoon describes the motion of a moving body. And if it's talking about a celestial body, it means that this sun and the moon, besides revolving, it's also rotating about its own axis. And today science tells us that the sun takes approximately 25 days to complete one rotation. Imagine what I read in school. I finished my school in 1982. Sun was stationary. 1400 years before the Quran says the sun rotates. And my science book said the sun was stationary. Today, it has been incorporated that the sun rotates. You ask him, that who could have mentioned this? There'll be a silent pause. Some critics will say, it's nothing great that the Quran speaks about astronomy because the Arabs were advanced in the field of astronomy. I do agree, the Arabs were advanced in the field of astronomy, but I'd like to remind them that it was centuries after the Quran was revealed that the Arabs became advanced in the field of astronomy. So it is from the Quran that the Arabs learned about astronomy and not the vice versa. In the subject of hydrology, when you ask the atheist, that you ask him about the water cycle, he will tell you that the water evaporates from the ocean. It forms into clouds. The clouds move into the interior. It falls down as rain, and the water will be replenished. You ask him, when did you come to know this? He will tell you it was in 1580, when Sir Bernard Palissy, he spoke about the water cycle for the first time. 1580. So you tell him, what you came to know in 1580, just hardly a couple of hundred years before, the Quran mentions 1400 years ago. The Quran says, the water evaporates from the ocean, formed into the clouds. The clouds move and join. The moon in the interior, and they fall down as rain, and the water is finished. The water cycle is spoken in the Quran in great detail in several places. Mentioned Surah Zumur, chapter 39, verse number 21. In Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 24. In Surah Hijar, chapter number 15, verse number 22. In Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 18. In Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 48. In Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 43. It's mentioned in Surah Naba, chapter number 78, verse number 12 to 14. It's mentioned in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse 57. In Surah Ra, chapter number 13, verse number 17. It's mentioned in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 40 and 49. It's mentioned in Surah Yasin, chapter number 36, verse number 34. It's mentioned in Surah Fatir, chapter number 35, verse number 9. It's mentioned in Surah Jasha, chapter number 45, verse number 5. In Surah Qaf, chapter number 50, verse number 9 and 10. It's mentioned in Surah Waqiyah, chapter number 56, verse number 67 to 70. It's mentioned in Surah Tariq, chapter number 86, verse number 11. I can go on and go on and go on, quoting only the verses in the Quran which speak about the water cycle only. The Quran speaks about the water cycle in great detail. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran 14 years ago? No reply? Don't worry, continue. The Quran speaks about geology. The geologists say that the radius of the earth is 3,750 miles. The deeper layers are hot and fluid. The upper layer is a thin crust, hardly 1 to 20 miles in thickness. And there are high possibilities that it will shake. It is due to the folding phenomena, which gives rise to mountain ranges, which prevents the earth from shaking. Allah mentioned this in the Quran. It's mentioned in the Quran. In Surah Naba, chapter number 78, verse number 7 as well as 8, Allah says, we have made the earth as an expanse and the mountains as pegs, which science has agreed today. A similar message is mentioned in Surah Ambiya, chapter 21, verse number 31, that we have placed on the earth mountains standing firm, lest it would shake with you. In the field of oceanology, previously we knew that there were two types of water, salt and sweet, but the Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse number 53, that 
It is he who has let free two bodies of flowing water. One sweet and palatable, the other salty and bitter. Though they meet, they do not mix. There is a barrier which is forbidden to be trespassed. We knew that there were two types of water, but what does the Quran mean there is a barrier which is forbidden to be trespassed? Today we know that whenever one type of water flows into the other type of water, it loses its constituents and gets homogenized into the water it flows. This homogenizing area is called as a barrier, a barzakh in the Quran. Quran mentioned this 14 years ago. Quran mentioned about biology. It's mentioned for Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30. We have created every living thing from water. Will you not then believe? Who could have believed in the deserts of Arabia that everything is made from water? Today, science tells us that every living thing is made from water.